Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome again to Lahem Panim. So glad you could join us today as we continue to study the book of Acts together. I'd like to start off by sharing with you a story that I came across involving an amazing spacecraft. Back in 1972, NASA launched the exploratory space probe Pioneer 10. Now, some of you may remember Pioneer 10. That was a little bit before my time. But according to Time Magazine, the Pioneer 10 satellite's primary mission was to reach Jupiter, photograph the planet and its moons, and beam that data back to Earth concerning Jupiter's magnetic field, its radiation belts, and its atmosphere. But scientists regarded this as a very bold plan because at that time, no Earth satellite had ever even gone beyond Mars. And they feared that the asteroid belt would destroy the satellite before it could ever even reach Jupiter. But Pioneer 10, amazingly, it accomplished its mission and so much more because when it was swinging past the giant planet in November of 1973, Jupiter's immense gravity hurled Pioneer 10 at a higher rate of speed toward the edge of the solar system. And at a billion miles from the sun, Pioneer 10 passed Saturn. At some 2 billion miles, it hurtled past Uranus. Neptune at nearly 3 billion miles. Pluto at almost 4 billion miles. And by 1997, 25 years after it had been launched, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. And despite that immense distance, Pioneer 10 continued to beam back radio signals to scientists on Earth. And perhaps most remarkable is that those signals emanate from an 8-watt transmitter, which radiates about as much power as a bedroom nightlight. And it takes more than nine hours for that signal to reach Earth. I mean, this was the little satellite that could. I mean, it wasn't qualified to do what it did. I mean, engineers, they had designed Pioneer 10 with a useful life of just three years. But no, it kept going and going and going. And by simple longevity, its tiny 8-watt transmitter radio accomplished more than anyone had ever dreamed possible. But you know, that's how it often is when you and I offer ourselves to God. God can work even through someone with 8-watt abilities if they are surrendered to Him and if they resolve never to quit in the midst of trials and difficulties and persecutions. Well, Paul was not a quitter. It didn't matter what difficulties, what persecutions, what imprisonments or beatings that he faced. No, he just like that Pioneer 10 satellite he would keep going and going and going. And through him, seeds were being planted that would eventually result in the whole world becoming turned upside down, or I should say right side up, with the good news of the gospel. It says in verse 1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So we see that Paul, he's come to Corinth. And he would need all his resilience, all his grit to start a church there in the city of Corinth. It was a city of 200,000 people. It was the political and commercial center of Greece. It even surpassed Athens in importance. But what would make it such a challenge was that it had a reputation for great wickedness and immorality. And that reputation was known all over the Roman Empire. In fact, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, was written in Corinth. Now, this immorality was largely due to the fact that on a large hill behind the city, there was a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and war. And the way to show your devotion to Aphrodite was by giving money to her temple and engaging in illicit 
sexual acts with male and female temple prostitutes. And that would make Corinth a real challenge for Paul because although there was great opportunity for ministry in Corinth, the church that would be founded there would always be tempted by that immorality that surrounded them on a daily basis, kind of like in our culture. And that's why Paul wrote a series of letters to the Corinthians that dealt in part with the problems of immorality. First and second Corinthians are two of those letters. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I look around me at the darkness of the world, I'm often tempted to get discouraged. And I've been very discouraged lately. I mean, watching the news is just so depressing. But I found that my time in the Word of God helps a lot. Because it reminds me that the darkness that we feel is nothing new. The world has been dark ever since the fall. And while you and I are in the midst of the darkness, God is still doing amazing things. And he's going to continue to do amazing things. No matter how dark things get, God can still use his little pioneer tens to change the world. And as we persevere, God's going to bring people into our lives who will help encourage us along the way. And that's the point I want you to remember most today. God will send you encouragement when you need it most. Paul had come to the city of Corinth alone. And yet it says in verse 2, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. Now, this is just another illustration of how God can use a very dark circumstance to work about his plan and his purpose. Because during this time, Emperor Claudius had expelled all the Jews from Rome. And the Roman historian Suetonius, he wrote, mind you, 70 years later, that Claudius did this because they were indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus. Now, Crestus was a common misspelling of Christus, the Latin word for Christ. And so it's commonly assumed that Suetonius refers to disturbances in the Jewish community that were sparked by the preaching of Christ. Now, writing 70 years after the fact, he wrongly assumed that Christ, Crestus, was the instigator of those riots. However, you and I know that it was really particular Jews who had set themselves against Christ and against this movement of Christianity. But out of this expulsion of the Jews from Rome, God brought Aquila and Priscilla to Corinth at the exact time they were needed. And because of that, they would become for Paul some of his dearest friends. Friends who we read in Romans 16, 3 through 4, would even be willing to risk their lives for him. Now, the way they came together was also important because remember that Paul, he had just finished ministering to the philosophers in Athens. But you know, there were philosophers and itinerant preachers in Corinth as well. And these philosophers and teachers, they would prey on ignorant and superstitious citizens. And so it would have been very easy for Paul and his ministry to kind of be lumped in with them and therefore misunderstood. And so it was very important for Paul to demonstrate to the people that he was different from all these other philosophers. And one of the ways that he did this was by supporting himself as a tent maker. And that was one of the things that made he and Aquila such a good fit because it says in verse 3, So because he, Paul, was of the same trade, he stayed with them, Priscilla and Aquila, and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. Now, in Jewish culture, rabbis did not accept money from their students. No, they earned their way by practicing a trade. All Jewish boys were expected to learn a trade no matter what profession they might enter. In fact, the rabbis used to say, he who does not teach his son to work, 
teaches him to steal. And so every boy would learn a trade that would allow him to earn a living. And Paul and Aquila were no exception. Both had been trained to be tent makers, which is a rendering of the Greek word skinapoios. Another possible rendering of that word is leather worker, which is a trade that included the making of tents, which were often made out of leather. And at this time and place, tents were used to house soldiers. So these tents may have been sold to the Roman army. But nevertheless, this was an occupation that was very well suited for Paul and his ministry because since he was always traveling, he had to have a business that he could just pick up and move from place to place. And that's what he was able to do as a tent maker. Now, when he wasn't making tents, Paul was sharing the gospel. Where? The synagogue. It says in verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And we know that that was really his main reason for being there in Corinth. And sometime during this time, Silas and Timothy rejoin him from Macedonia. And 2 Corinthians 11.9 tells us that they did so bringing financial aid. And what this did was it freed Paul to devote himself more fully to the preaching of the gospel. It says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, this brings us to point number two, which is this. Where Satan brings opposition, God creates opportunity. Where Satan brings opposition, God creates opportunity. Now, the opposition that Satan created, it came through unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews had been Paul's adversaries in Thessalonica and Berea. And we're now in Corinth demonstrating the same rejection of the gospel, beginning once again to stir up trouble for Paul and his friends. And this kind of opposition is usually proof that God is at work. And you know, that ought to encourage us, because I like what Spurgeon used to say. He used to say, the devil never kicks a dead horse. And here we find Satan, he's kicking because he sees the awesome power of what's happening here in Corinth and throughout much of the world. Because wherever Christianity is going, culture is changing. People are being freed from slavery to sin, slavery to fear. They're experiencing restoration into a relationship with God in and through Jesus Christ. And they're being freed from Satan's clutches. And so Satan, he's trying to counteract this. And he's no doubt hoping that Paul's going to get discouraged, that he's going to quit, that his eight-watt strength is just going to give out. But Paul, he remains undaunted. And while this kind of opposition had forced him to leave Thessalonica and Berea, we find that here in Corinth, he is determined to stay. And next week, we'll see his response to this opposition. But in your own life today, maybe you feel a little bit like Pioneer 10. Like your eight watts of energy could give out at any moment. Maybe you feel the attacks of Satan against your life and against your ministry. If you do, let me encourage you with what Paul said that God revealed to him in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let Christ be your strength this week. 
Let him use whatever you offer him to produce great fruit for his kingdom. Let's do so. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.